Hey there sculptors, welcome back to the studio. In the previous tutorial, we wired up our kind of base armatures. And in this tutorial, we're gonna to start to talk a little bit more about um, how to use uh, historical references and some anatomical proportional guides uh, to bend our uh, wire armatures into their final positions. And um, one of the biggest tricks here, right, is to, um, you know, work in the round, kind of be eyeballing where the lines of the body are, where uh, the body breaks, where the sort of um, mechanics of the body is moving, what are the limits of the body, right? Bodies don't exactly move like wire, so how do we make wire move like we do? And so we have to pay really close attention to things like joints and uh, some proportional measurements, um, and then uh, be really kind of deliberate about arranging this form. If we can get our armatures right, um, that adding the clay work, which comes down the road, um, becomes a, a, a much easier process. We can't correct for, um, for badly positioned bodies later on with clay. We're always going to be limited by what we do on the inside. Um, so in order to make that happen, uh, we're going to do a couple of things today in this tutorial. We'll take a look at some historical examples. Uh, we are going to uh, come back to our ideal proportion sheet and do some marking here. Uh, and then we'll actually get down to bending uh, this wire a little bit. Um, one of the most important things uh, that we'll do over the next day or so here is um, you're going to be choosing uh, what you want your posed figure uh, to look like. I'm going to suggest that you use a piece of classical sculpture or a piece of um, piece of sculpture that uh, is represented in a museum. That way uh, they likely have very high quality images of it and even multiple angles of your pose. But before we actually choose, uh, before we actually choose what we're going to be sculpting, let's take a look at um, how, uh, how we're going to break down uh, this sort of the body of our sculpted form. There are a lot of different sort of proportional models you could be using right now, um, demonstrating using this one, uh, which is a male form. And, uh, and what I'm going to do is make a few marks on the body here that are going to help sort of determine where uh, the sort of placements of my armature are and um, how to sort of take measurements off them. I find that actually making some of these marks right onto my proportional guide is really handy. Uh, so let's start with our hips, right? These are at the sort of ball and socket insertion place uh, just below the iliac crest of our subject. And, uh, and I'm going to make a line. I'm using a black marker, so it's easier for you guys to see in the video. Uh, and this is, um, this is something that I think you guys should do on your models as well, uh, because it really makes the measuring process a bit easier. And then I'll mark off where our spine went. The spine sort of is along this center line. Uh, sort of cuts down centrally through the body, and our spine is the, uh, the double-wrapped eighth-inch aluminum wire. And then we're looking for, the, again, the ball and socket joint of the shoulder insertions. Uh, that happens just above the pec and just inside of um, just inside of that kind of outer muscular shoulder. And generally, right, these are uh, a wider, this is a wider uh, sort of connection than, uh, than the hips, right? So you have this sort of triangular uh, arrangement of the features already where we have broad shoulders and it comes sort of down to a point uh, down here, sort of just above the knees or so. Now, uh, imagine, right, that all of this fleshy tissue on the outside uh, of the sculpture is going to pack out uh, this form. It's going to sort of flesh out this form. Uh, and so whenever we're running the wire through the clay, or as I'm building out the armature here, I'm always imagining uh, that it's going to travel through the center of, uh, of all of these, um, all the kind of fleshy tissue. I don't want the armature to be sticking out. And so uh, I'll make a few more marks here. Uh, like, for example, I'm going to mark the knees and maybe the ankle joints and connect those down through the hip joints. So this uh, is very similar to then what we've built out in our, uh, on our armature. Right now, our armature legs are very straight soon. They're going to have to kind of pick up some of these very specific bend spots. Um, and if this is starting to look a little bit skeletal, um, that's not a bad way to think about armatures. Uh, now, a skeleton has much more information in it than an armature does. Um, skeletons actually sort of uh, give us some of our bony shape on the surface. So in some ways, you could say that we, you know, we reveal uh, some of the skeleton that's inside of us. 
uh, armatures shouldn't ever really get revealed other than maybe locate specific things like a shoulder bend or an elbow bend. Uh, but remember, these things give structure. And so as you're considering the pose, uh, you know, this guy here is standing very firmly and flatly on his feet. And we'll talk about some historical examples of sculpture that do that. Um, but if you're going to uh, take a little bit more dynamic pose, uh, like for example here, right, you might kind of consider before you start cutting the legs or shaping too much, um, what's my uh, main structural point going to be? Do I have two feet on the ground? Do I have one foot on the ground? Is there maybe a hand touching the ground? Something that's going to support the clay uh, and then we'll mount them into a sculptural block. So start kind of thinking this through already. Even if you don't know exactly what you want to sculpt yet, uh, consider what parts of the wire armature are going to be your point of contact with the wooden block. Now, uh, our armatures are, are going, not going to include any metal that goes up into the neck of our subject. We just really don't need uh, that much support for such a small figure. Uh, if you started sculpting larger, then of course you would have to consider uh, adding metal up into the head of your subject. Or for that matter, if your subject is really in a dynamic, strange pose, you might have to actually build in some extra support somewhere. Um, now, I'm going to leave uh, this sort of wireframe off of these other characters for now, but uh, we'll very likely use that as, um, as sort of this ongoing uh, reference. So I want you to keep this wireframe in mind for a moment as I kind of, kind of jump um, into some historical reference and some touch points so that you can get sort of feel confident to do just a little bit of research on your own here uh, to sort of find something that you're interested in. Now, well, we're going to take a look at these two stone figures, these two marble figures first. Both of them date uh, to about the same time period, think about 590, 600 BC or so. And uh, one of them is an Egyptian piece, and one of them is a Greek kouros, a, a famous sort of funerary uh, sculpture. Both of them are carved out of stone, and so in some ways they're similar in form to what we're doing, except we're not going to be carving from a large block of stone. We'll be adding clay to a wire, so there is some difference here. But what I want you to pay particular attention to is, uh, is going to sort of help us understand what this sculptor is thinking about, what they're doing, and how they're working with the form itself. Uh, these sort of wire frames that I've added to the two characters will help us as sculptors understand um, how to think about the arrangement of these features and the proportions of these people. Do the shoulders move at all in reference to the hips? No, they're very square and straight up and down and almost abstract in their arrangement. Uh, these two figures are very rigid, uh, especially when compared to some of these later sculptures we'll look at. Uh, consider, though, uh, some of the kind of advanced qualities of these. Now, these, uh, these pieces um, and this sculptural style, right, uh, illustrates a sculptor's ability to take a large block of stone uh, in the case of the Kuros, which is a slightly larger than life-size figure. This is a 2,000 pound block of marble that is essentially resting on two thinly sculpted ankles um, and has stood that way uh, and continues to stand that way at the Met Museum in New York. Uh, and so uh, it, it's, a, it's a sculpting feat, right, to have balanced all of that stone on two small uh, spots down here at the bottom. Now I want to kind of zoom out just a little bit and think about uh, as we kind of move forward in sculpting history, uh, one of the more famous kind of recognizable pieces, right, is Michelangelo's David, uh, is um, this shift from a very rigid form, a form that sort of keeps those shoulders and hips in alignment, uh, sort of almost idealistic approach to the human, uh, human representation, to something that seems a bit more human. Now uh, the David uh, or the Davide is um, much larger than the Kuros, uh, except it it has a feel that is even more human in a way. It brings it down to earth. It's a freestanding sculpture again that uh, is thousands of pounds of marble and uh, balanced carefully on a couple of skinny, spindly little legs here. Uh, but what mostly sort of gives it this even more humanistic or more naturalistic pose is the sort of arrangement of the hips and the shoulders and the curving spine. This, uh, in the uh, sort of Renaissance era, Italian sculpting scene was referred to as contraposto, and it was uh, executed by sculptors and painters alike, and it was an attempt uh, to sort of look back at sculptors of antiquity and try to uh, update their techniques, update the technology, and update the sort of representational form of uh, the human, uh, of the human body. 
And so uh, what I would like for you guys to do is borrow a similar approach uh, to arranging the body. I don't want you uh, to keep your sculptural um, armatures rigid, in other words. I want you to arrange these, uh, these pieces using some of the insights learned by Renaissance era sculptors like Michelangelo and using the curve, the natural sort of curves of the body to express a much more relaxed pose. Uh, it's more challenging uh, for us as sculptors to arrange the body in this way. We have to be very careful about um, taking uh, measurements of each, body po uh, of each body joint and arranging it in space. Now, another sculptor I just want to point out here before I completely wrap up my sort of quick history lesson is a French sculptor who is working uh, much, much later. You might even call him contemporary by comparison. Um, he was working in France in the sort of early 1900s and uh, became very famous uh, for his forms. And uh, it's, he was uh, collected so heavily in the United States that you very likely have seen uh, a, a Rodin piece. Now I'll start maybe out here. We'll take a look at these two bronzes, both of them executed by uh, Rodin in clay and then cast in bronze. Uh, and what I want you to, uh, to take a look at is sort of the arrangement of the uh, armature which sort of moves through them. Now he doesn't have an armature inside of these bronze pieces. The bronze itself is strong enough to, to sort of stand up, but I want you to imagine as a sculptor how you might arrange the bodies according uh, to sort of his models. Uh, Rodin would be an excellent sort of sculptor to mimic in a way uh, because one, his work is so heavily collected and heavily photographed. It should be very easy to find multiple angles of his sculptures. And he is referencing some of these Renaissance and even earlier classical era uh, poses of the body in order to sort of prevent, present the body in a very naturalistic way. Um, how do we arrange the body, right, is your question. And so this is actually the piece, which looks a little funny. doesn't really look like it should be by the same artist, but uh, this was a sculptural sketch completed by Rodin, and it's in the collection of the Met in New York, um, where I actually recommend that uh, you actually use this one as a sculptural reference. Um, it's kind of nice in a way to work with unfinished uh, reference materials uh, because um, it takes some of this sort of fear and anxiety out of like, I don't think I can sculpt like Rodin, that feeling, right? Um, but you can work in the same way as Rodin in the sense that he also made sketches, he also practiced, and uh, this sort of small piece or these two small pieces are great examples. And so I, uh, in today's demonstration, will be working with this left figure here, trying to arrange my armature in that way. Uh, I'm going to free up my figure from this large uh, sort of clay uh, plinth block or this kind of supporting structure behind him, which looks like it could be like a tree stump or something. Uh, because we're using armatures, I don't have to use that structural clay block to support my figure. Uh, but I'm going to use the same body arrangement in order to arrange these ones. Now, I actually recommend going to uh, the website of the Met and finding this. I'll provide the links for you. Uh, but one of the nice things about it is that it has multiple angles available for us to study from. Uh, this is invaluable as you look for uh, sculptural references uh, for what you're doing. Uh, and because this piece is uh, in the public domain, you can download the files and put them on your computer and so that you have uh, nice big sculptural references to be able to do this work um, you know, on your own time. Uh, so since this one is available and easy enough for us to find, I'll put that out there as one of your options. Um, it's the one that I'll be using in my demonstration. If you guys choose to go looking, uh, that's great. I'll help point you in a couple different directions. I would say start with your big museums. They usually have some of the best uh, reference materials. A lot of it is free. Um, but if you are looking for something else, uh, I can help you kind of figure out what's going to be uh, workable and what's not. Say, for example, you really wanted to work with athletic postures, right? Uh, it's one thing to sort of use photographs as references of your favorite athletes. Uh, it's quite another to photograph one of your friends uh, from multiple angles so that you can use them as reference material in the arrangement of your pieces. So I'm actually going to begin by bending up. Uh, one of my examples here, I'm going to leave my screen sort of flipped up so that I can see uh, the reference material. I'm going to keep my anatomical references close by so that I can um, take my measurements as I'm working. And, uh, and I'll also have a couple of tools close by to work with.
the tools that you guys will need to do some of these uh, will be uh, needle nose pliers again of some species. Um, this one has a really long skinny point on it which might be sort of useful for getting into tight areas and sort of bending uh, but they they sort of lack some strength way out at the point right you kind of get a lot more strength uh, back toward the end. I like these linesman's pliers for this for that reason. They're sort of blunted off at the nose and I feel like I can get a really good grip onto the wires with these. Um, by comparison, uh, these barrel nose pliers don't have any knurling in them. They're actually a jeweler's pliers and so where some of these other uh, tools will mar up the aluminum really badly, uh, the jeweler's pliers that has rounded ends uh, is a little bit easier on the steel. And then if uh, the back end of your tool doesn't have a wire breaker, uh, you're very likely going to need some kind of wire cutter uh, for today's lesson as well. I'll be using probably each one of these at some point. Uh, but as you're working, uh, you'll want to keep those with your kit. Uh, I'll provide some for you guys at school, uh, but if you're going to be doing work from home or back and forth, uh, you might want to travel with them while you're working out your posing. Uh, it may take you a day or two just to get your pose just right. The very first thing that I'm going to do with my uh, with my armature, I'm going to line it up on my um, sort of proportional guide here and mark off where the joints will be. It's probably not a bad idea to use maybe a marker and pre-mark some of those uh, some of those measurements and you could take those measurements right off of the guide or you may find that using or you may find that using your caliper is also a really nice way to take these measurements uh, measuring from joint to joint and then bringing those measurements down to uh, to your armature and once you uh, once you start bending this aluminum, uh, it has sort of limits as to uh, how far you can take it. Uh, if you find um, if you find that you're working with the aluminum and it's going bending, bending, bending back and forth and back and forth, it eventually fatigues to the point where it will just snap. Uh, so since you don't want to have to remake your whole armature here, don't do that. Don't work it and work it and work it until it snaps. So I have marked my elbow. Now I'm going to go from the elbow to the wrist and I will mark it first with some sort of black sharpie or a, you know something that will leave a mark on the aluminum and then bend it and I'm not making my large bends in the direction of, uh, of my model just yet I'm just kind of placing those bends on my character just so that I have a little bit better sense of where my body is going to be breaking. Uh, so I have a joint and a joint and a joint and a joint and I'm going to leave the shoulders uh, in their own arrangement for right now as I place the knee joints. And these can be fairly subtle bends for right now. Uh, right now I'm really just kind of placing them in about the right position. And then the last thing I want to sort of consider before I actually start working on the posing here is, um, you know, how am I going to be thinking about the thickness areas? Some of the uh, some of the thicknesses that we've got going on in this piece, um, we may run into small issues uh, because especially down at the wrist, we may have a little bit too much metal. Uh, that too much metal is um, is going to cause issues if I need to sculpt a very thin wrist and so we can do a couple of things to alleviate some of that problem. I'm going to mark off my foot here see if I have enough yeah and also keep in mind that even though I'm going to have a foot dangling on the end there foot doesn't really need much support out towards the uh, the toes so depending on your sculptural arrangement this actually may be you know wire that ends up uh, protruding down into the sculptural block. Uh, so as you're thinking about your feet, right, a foot doesn't require a whole lot of structure, uh, so don't get too crazy bending here. Instead of bending my, uh, my left leg, because that's going to go down into the block, I'm just going to mark where that foot will belong. Okay, so I've got roughly, you know, my character is starting to sort of have some of these qualities. Now I'm going to spend uh, probably 20 minutes, maybe a half an hour, carefully sculpting out and arranging the form. I'll, I'll begin that work here and then I'll pick it up in class again so you guys can sort of see how, I'm, how, it, uh, how it goes. Uh, before I get all the way in there, I may just remove a little bit of this winding from around the hand 
so that my hands and wrists can stay nice and thin. And if you are at all concerned about actually getting that uh, clay to be able to stick to the, uh, to the aluminum wire, uh, you can put some very small notches into the aluminum wire itself. This uh, will make the, the wire sort of sticky enough that it will hold on to the clay. Uh, be careful as you make these little bite marks in the clay with a wire cutter or something. Um, you can actually extend the clay, right? So you can kind of mess with your proportions. Or if, uh, if you get a little too aggressive with your biting, uh, you can actually um, snip right through it. Okay, so I may end up, you know, snipping off a little bit of that material with the hands too, but uh, for now he's posed just about the way I need him. So uh, the general pose I need to sort of figure out now and is I'm going to use some of my uh, reference photographs of the Rodin uh, practice. And I want to sort of get the overall kind of movement of the body. And so from the front view here, I can see that there's a head sort of laid down to one side and um, a flowing line that essentially flows from the top of the head down around the back and down through that left leg. Um, it's a very um, sort of contraposto-like sculpture in that all of the weight of this individual comes down through one leg, moves up through the torso, and then out the top of the head. So I'm paying attention to that curving line and carefully trying to uh, wrestle in uh, that curving line into, uh, into, the, into the spine and the hips. I'm also paying very close attention to the alignment of the shoulders and the hips to each other. In this contraposto pose, uh, his right hip is higher and his left hip is lower. And I'll be able to achieve that essentially by, uh, by pivoting the, the angle that the spine is inserting into, uh, into the hips. Some of this work you might be able to do with your fingers. Uh, as you're working with it in this way, uh, you may find that um, you need the pliers as a bit of a, uh, as a, bit of a savior. Uh, that's okay, go ahead and kind of grab onto it with the pliers and kind of wrench this thing around a little bit until it, uh, until it feels about right. Now I'm going to kind of dip the shoulders in the same way. Uh, so the hips and the shoulders are sort of in opposition to each other. So I'm going to get a hold of the spine again and sort of tip the way that the shoulders are being sort of engaged on the top. So already my character here is starting to pick up a little bit more personality. And uh, from here, I'll just be moving those arms around little by little and the legs around little by little until it comes into position. Guys, I'm excited to see what you choose as your sculptural reference, and I'm excited to sort of work alongside you to get your pieces into their poses. I'll, uh, I'll catch up with you in the studio.